welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, well, um, well, we'll go ahead and get started now. There are still people um, entering the webinar, but we'll, we'll catch up with us. Um, my name is Sarah Carr, and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar. Um, our speaker today is Peter Jones from the University College of London. Um, and he's going to be speaking about incentive diversity is key to the more effective land Equitable and governance equitable. Oh, yeah. and equitable governance of marine protected areas. Um, sorry about that, Peter. And before we get started, um, we uh, I wanted to let you know that we'll be we'll have a set presentation, and then we'll have a dedicated time for question and answer after uh, the webinar. Um, in order to ask questions, the though we have a question panel in the user interface. I'd encourage you to put questions for Peter there. But if you had questions that you wanted everyone to see um, or that other people might be able to answer, or if you were asking for experiences, um, feel free to put things in the chat, uh, which you can direct to all attendees or just Peter and myself. Uh, but if you put it in for all the attendees, others can uh, answer or share their experiences. Um, if you do use the chat for all attendees, um, we just ask that you keep it on topic and professional. Um, so I'll just say welcome to Peter. We're so glad you could be here today, and I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to give this webinar, Sarah. Very much appreciated. Um, I'm going to talk today about the conclusion. Incentive diversity is, is key to the more effective and equitable governance of marine protected areas. Um, so there's a conclusion. How did we arrive at this conclusion? That's kind of like the academic title to the talk. Um, but really what we're talking about is how can we influence the behavior of people who use marine resources in a way that fulfills both resource use and marine conservation priorities. Fundamentally, this research takes a human behavior approach and we're focused on governance as, as how can we influence the behavior of people to achieve these dual priorities. Or to put it another way, it's all about people. Um, it's all about how we govern the behavior of people because at the end of the day, we don't govern ecosystems. We don't manage ecosystems. We ma they're very good at managing themselves. So, but I also particularly want to mention that my co-authors, Rick Stafford, Isabel Hess and Zhuang Chu, along with the over 70 people who contributed to these case studies and the thousand plus people who participated in the research behind these 50 case studies. But let's go back to basics. I'm an academic at heart, so I like to take things back to first principles. And three sources of governance steer are recognized, noting that the verb to govern is derived from Plato's use of the Greek verb to steer. And we, there are three approaches to run through these. You're all familiar with them, but we have top down, state control, regulations, rule of law, bottom up, participation and empowerment of local people. And third, we have markets, economic instruments, assignation of property rights, etc. And the current focus in contemporary governance debates and initiatives is very much on market and participative approaches. But there is a resurgent interest in the role of the state, recognizing that the role of the state is evolving as society evolves, becoming more about decentralization rather than command and control. Though this reconfigured role of the state remains important, especially in the face of challenges such as climate change and biodiversity loss. And there's growing recognition overall, to cut a long story short, in governance debates, 
that there's a need to move beyond ideological arguments as to which of the above approaches is best or which of the above approaches is right. Instead, we need to develop governance models, frameworks and approaches that combine the role of states, markets and people. And again, being an academic, I like my definitions. So governance, our, there are many, there are dozens of definitions of governance out there. I'm afraid we've added another one. But in this context, governance means steering human behavior through combinations of state, market, and civil society approaches. Civil society approaches is another term for bottom-up approaches. Combinations of these three approaches in order to achieve strategic objectives. Resilience, another key concept, is, is the capacity for stability in the face of potentially perturbing forces. Resilience was originally developed and used very widely by engineers. Uh, the, the, the planes, the, the wings on planes are, are, are resilient and they're tested so that they can withstand the forces that are perturbing them. So resilience is increasingly being adopted by social ecological systems researchers. And now we're looking at the stability of the ecosystem and the, and the social system uh, to potentially perturbing forces like climate change, population growth and globalization. And then the question becomes, how should we go about steering human uses of marine protected areas in order to make them effective and equitable and build resilience to climate change and other potentially perturbing environmental and human influences. And we all recognize the old way, top-down monocentric governance, also known as command and control or in the context of protected areas, fortress conservation. That was the old approach, which was widely developed after the Second World War. We're certainly not proposing to go back to that. But after the, in, in, the, in the 60s, 70s and into the, into the 90s, the, bottom, the concept of bottom-up polycentric governance began to gain traction, principally through the groundbreaking research of, of Eleanor Ostrom, who of course was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics for her inspirational work on the governance of, of common pool resources. And she was very much focused on place-based self-governance of common pool resources. And she developed the related social ecological systems framework that many of you may be familiar with and is illustrated in this slide. And importantly, this place-based self-governance assumes that ecosystems can be divided into discrete places that can be self-governed by local actors through, through local knowledge. But what about human and ecological interconnections between places, particularly given the scale and connectivity of marine ecosystems? So we have fish populations that swim. If we imagine these are our places here on marine protected areas, for instance, and we have fish populations that, are, that move between the places, the marine ecosystems themselves are bigger than the places. So there's a free circulation of, of, of ecological, various ecological structures and populations between places. And also we have mobile people, fishermen move between places, tourist development, development tourism developers move between places. So to, 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 to paraphrase a, a saying, no, no marine protected area is an island. So this starts to call into question, how can a marine protected area be a place self-governed purely by local actors? It also assumes that, that linkages between places act purely as channels for cooperation, deliberation, negotiation, and conflict resolution amongst actors. Actors are just people involved within and between places with no state interference from the top down. But is this realistic given competition within and between places for access to and utilization of natural resources? If we have a fish population that straddles all these marine protected areas, all these places, but though each place is managed on a self-governed basis, how do we manage the, 
the, the linkages between these places that are mediated by the migratory nature of the population or indeed the migratory nature of the humans that exploit them. And for, for those basic reasons, we found that whilst the social ecological systems framework um, is, is a fascinating empirical framework, we, we couldn't readily apply it to our case studies because this basic principle of, of well-defined boundaries and place-based self-governance doesn't map very well onto marine ecosystems given their scale and connectivity. Of course, CPR researchers recognize that where these scale challenges and related collective action problems within and between places cannot be resolved through local deliberations and, and the roles of horizontal and vertical linkages, centralized state intervention may be required. Eleanor Ostrom uh, recognized that sometimes collective action problems can't be overcome through place-based self-governance. But because the majority of place-based marine self-governance governance initiatives, including marine protected areas, will raise such intractable conflicts within and between places. We found that the, the exceptions become the norm, i.e. all the MPAs end up with some form of state interference, we would prefer to call it state mediation, um, and the exceptions become the norm. So this reduces the potential applicability of the concept of polycentrism and the related social ecological system empirical framework. Polycentrism, often people say, well, what does polycentrism mean? What does Eleanor Ostrom's concept of polycentrism, which is central to CPR governance? Really, it means decentralization, but with the assumption that governance has swung from the top down to entirely bottom up with no state interference. Very important principle of Eleanor Ostrom's research. So having explored various other concepts and theories, we came to the view that the, the CPR governance framework, just we couldn't realistically map it on to our MPA case studies. But nonetheless, inspired by the systematic approach to research that uh, Eleanor Ostrom practiced, and also by the work, early work of Richard Norgard on social ecological systems, we adopted the concept of co-evolutionary governance. This recognises that we need to move beyond top-down monocentric governance or bottom-up polycentric governance. We need to move beyond that dichotomy to recognise the role of the state in co-evolutionary governance. As such, co-evolutionary governance is an applied realist institutional analysis approach based on the grounded theory of co-evolutionary governance. And this concept was also inspired by my long-standing fascination with co-evolution, first described by Charles Darwin in 1859, although he didn't actually use the term, but he did discuss how the evolution of plants and their pollinating insect, insects could not be understood just by studying either of these groups of organisms in isolation. As Flower, the, the flowers of plants and the morphology of, of pollinating insects co-evolves through ecological interactions and reciprocal evolutionary changes. And co-evolutionary governance takes the same rationale and applies it to governance approaches, that they co-evolve through interactions and reciprocal changes. So here we see a marine protected area illustrated as a cross-sectoral governance initiative within a co-evolutionary governance framework. It's cross-sectoral. We need, we have various different sectors that operate in marine seas and all of them need to take decisions in such a way that contributes to the MPA's objectives. So this intersectoral integration, we consider in terms of horizontal co-evolution, but we also have vertical co-evolution. MPAs are also embedded in both higher level and local level institutions, people, hence the need for the integration of top down and bottom up approaches represented here as, vert uh, as vertical co-evolution. So co-evolutionary governance, this is just a very quick introduction to the concept. It addresses a dilemma of, of whether 
institutions should be built from the bottom up through self-governance, as the polycentric concept considers they should be, or from the top down through state imposition, as the now rejected monocentric concept considers they should be. Instead, institutions co-evolve through a functionally integrated combination of top-down and bottom-up approaches, along with the pervasive influence of markets. And we discussed this in terms of decentralization in the shadow of hierarchy, uh, which is a, a discussion I refer you to these sources to explore in more depth. But in essence, the state is now playing an indirect steering role. It still provides an important coordinating function. It occasionally arbitrates uh, on conflicts and, and disputes. But as much as possible, all the governance is bottom-up. So it's a combination of top-down and bottom-up approaches. OK, that's enough of the theory. Let's look at the MPA policy target context for this research. And we're all familiar now, I think, with the, with, with the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, target three of which states that by 2030, at least 30% of marine and coastal areas are effectively conserved and managed through ecologically representative, well-connected and equitably governed systems of protected areas. So the key words here are effectively conserved and equitably governed. These are the focus for this research, recognizing, of course, indigenous and traditional territories while ensuring that any sustainable use where appropriate in MPAs is fully consistent with conservation outcomes. So this is the policy context for the work. Where are we up to? Well, the UN World Database on Protected Areas estimates that 8.35% of the global ocean is protected by around eight, nearly 19,000 marine protected areas. But more detailed analyses by the Marine Conservation Institute estimate that in fact only 2.9% of the global ocean area is effectively protected by around 253 predominantly large marine protected areas out of a total of 16,319 MPAs. So they're going into much more depth than the World Database on Protected Areas, actually looking at the stage of establishment. And our research builds on this excellent research by the Marine Conservation Institute and actually goes down to individual case studies uh, and studies how governance is working and how effective they are on an individual case study basis. But what the, MC, the Marine Conservation Institute research has shown is that the world is littered with many ineffective paper marine protected areas. We also know that coverage within marine ecoregions of the world, the wonderful MEOW acronym, is also uneven and variable. So we're a long way from achieving that 30% by 2030 target. Many more effective MPAs will need to will be needed to achieve this target. And these, of course, must also be just and equitable. So it's widely recognized that the design and management of MPAs must be both top down and bottom up. I'm certainly not the first person to say that. That's been said for 25 years now, at least. Usually, design and management must, of MPAs must be both top down and bottom up, usually through some form of co-management but what does this actually mean in practice? What does combine top-down and bottom-up approaches and integrate them with market approaches mean in reality? How should we go about steering human uses of marine protected areas to make them more effective and equitable and build resilience to climate change and other potentially perturbing environmental and human influences? These are the key questions that the MPA Governance Project aims to address now through 50 case studies in 24 countries. And again, I'm not going to go into the detail of each of these case studies. I'm sure you're relieved to hear. But this is an empirical case study based approach. The concept of MPAs as co-evolutionary social ecological systems actually emerged from the findings of this case study rather than forcing the concept onto the case studies 
our, our understanding of the concept of co-evolutionary governance, which was out there before we started our research, we found resonated with what we were observing more than, uh, the, more than polycentrism resonated with the reality. So we have 50 MPAs. Don't worry too much about these effectiveness scores here. But um, suffice to say, of course, that a zero out of five is a very ineffective MPA. And we don't have a single one of these case studies that got five out of five. But this just shows the rough distribution of the 50 marine protected area governance case studies in 24 countries. And this is not a random sample, it's more opportunistic. But nor is it targeted at MPAs that prove the hypothesis of co-evolutionary governance. Uh, this is a reasonably representative of sample of large and small MPAs in, in in many countries. There are some underrepresented countries, but nonetheless, it is quite a significant sample size. And this, as I've mentioned already, this these 50 case studies have involved 70 researchers, including masters and PhD students, other academic researchers, and marine protected area practitioners from around the world, as well as 1, 000, over 1,000 people that have contributed to the case studies through interviews. Now, there's an Amish saying that a great deal of what we see depends on what we are looking for, what we expect to see, perhaps. And we need a way of looking at marine protected area governance that can see all the issues and, pro and approaches. Now, these lines are straight and parallel, but we need a calibrated framing to see this. These circles are the same diameter, but again, our eyes have been deceived and we need a Again, we need a calibrated framing to see this. And in effect, our empirical framework is, is, is a wide angle calibrated empirical lens. We can take this lens and, uh, and use it to look at any given case study in the world and use it to, to analyze the governance of that case study in a way that the results can be compared to other case studies. And there's insufficient time to describe all the elements of this framework, but to suffice to say that it pivots around effectiveness. Effectiveness in terms of the degree to which impacts have been reduced. Or a, a score of five out of five, would all impacts would be fully addressed and reduced. So this is effectiveness based on the reduction of, of the impacts of human activities. But of course, this is very important, along with equity issues as a key consideration, recognising that effectiveness and equity are inextricably intertwined. So each of these 50 case studies populates this empirical framework involving primary empirical ethnographic research, predominantly semi-structured interviews, around 20 semi-structured interviews for each case study, along with document analyses, policy analyses, media analyses, and of course, observations of activities in the field, conversations with a research purpose. And this, this empirical framework is described in much greater detail in the supplementary material to the paper that this presentation is based on. And to analyze the diversity of approaches that MPAs employ, governance approaches that they employ, we developed a typology of 36 incentives. Perhaps it's more of a taxonomy than a typology. I originally trained as a biologist. I now do most of my research in human geography, uh, but you can take the researcher out of the biology lab, but you can't take the biologist out of the researcher. So I see this primarily as a taxonomy of, of these five governance approaches. So we have 36 incentives, 10 economic incentives, 10 legal incentives, top down, and 10 participative incentives, bottom up, along with three communication incentives and three knowledge incentives. And again, it's worth noting that this taxonomy of incentives was finessed and emerged through this case study research. So incentives are particular types of institution that are designed to encourage <coughs> actors, i.e. people, to, to, to behave in a manner that provides for certain policy outcomes 
particularly conservation objectives to be achieved. And the interviews and policy analyses indicated which incentives were used in setting up and managing MPAs and which were particularly in need of strengthening or introducing to improve effectiveness and equity. We would just have, we would probably get through an interview and never word, use the word governance or incentive. You just have a conversation with people about what's working about this MPA and perhaps what could work better. And slowly we explore it, different people's views on which incentives are being used, which ones need strengthening, and which ones need introducing to better reduce impacts. And there's insufficient time today to discuss specific incentives and the various ways in which they are applied and combined, although each one of these 50 case studies has got a publication behind, behind it, all of which are, are cited in this paper. And that's where the really rich detail of the story of each marine protected area really comes to life. But let's look at some broad findings. And what we found is that the 50 MPAs in this analysis tend to use around 18 incentives and particularly need around six incentives to be introduced. So as a rough rule of thumb, 20, around 24 incentives seems, seem to be commonly used or needed, i.e. two thirds of the 36 incentives are used or needed in any given case study. 41% of the used incentives in these case studies were considered to be particularly in need of strengthening, i.e. they were too weak. And this explains the relatively low effectiveness score for these 50 MPAs. The average effectiveness score was only two out of five, which means some impacts partly addressed, but some impacts not yet addressed. We also cal cal calculated the average used or needed rate across the 50 case studies. So, for example, a 0% averaged used or needed rate would indicate that no incentives in that category were used or needed in a single case study whilst a used or needed rate of 100% would indicate that all incentives in that category were used or needed in all the case studies. And the average used or needed rates indicate that all categories of incentives are both used or needed to varying degrees, with the spread of used or needed rates across the five categories of incentives. So whilst Communications incentives have the highest used or needed rate, followed by legal incentives. Knowledge, participation and communication incentives are also frequently identified as used or needed. And this illustrates the importance of focusing on how a diversity of incentives from different categories, different governance approaches can be combined to, to, and functionally integrated to promote effective and equitable MPAs. We also disaggregated the two in calculating the average use rate and the average needed rate for incentives in each category. And what we found is communication incentives were most frequently discussed as being used and legal incentives were most frequently discussed as being needed. And this makes practical sense as communication incentives are almost universally required in all MPAs, awareness being an essential prerequisite to participation, cooperation, and compliance. Communication incentives also tend to be relatively inexpensive and easy to put in place. Hence, it follows that they will be the most frequently recognized as the most utilized, used category of incentives. Legal incentives, on the other hand, can be challenging to put in place. They require state capacity and support, i.e. political will. However, the need for them is widely appreciated. Hence, it follows that they will be the most frequently recognized as most needed. We also focused in on specific incentives. And again, I haven't got time to go into the findings for each of the individual incentives, but a quick snapshot of some overall findings. Uh, we broke them down into used, 
not used but particularly important uh, uh, used but particularly important priorities for strengthening and not used but particularly important priorities for introducing and the incentives most frequently considered to be used or needed um, are evenly spread across all five categories. The most frequently used or needed incentive being the capacity for enforcement here. And the least frequently used or needed is payments for ecosystem services, which is interesting in itself. A great deal of theoretical and ideological interest in payments for ecosystem services but actually very rarely used or even considered needed. So again, we've seen this mismatch between, between a lot of conceptual theoretical discussions and what's happening on the, on the beach and on the ground and on the sea in reality. The six incentives most frequently cited as, as, as used are dominated by communication incentives, three communication incentives here in, in yellow, along with two economic in red and one legal incentive. Two economic in, in, in blue, sorry, and one legal incentive in red. Most frequently used is, is raising awareness. Then we look come to the most frequently cited as needed. And this is very much dominated by legal incentives reinforcing this message that it's the legal incentives that are most commonly found to be wanting, uh, to be high priorities for introducing or, or strengthening. In this case, it's, it, it's introducing. But four of the six most needed incentives are legal, but we also have two participative incentives, i.e. bottom-up incentives. So again, this illustrates the need to combine top-down and bottom-up approaches. Most frequently in need of introducing incentive 26, transparency, accountability, and fairness. And I don't, again, have time to go into the details of this, but this is something to look at in more detail afterwards. We can also consider the 14 incentives that are more frequently cited uh, as used or needed, highlighted here in yellow. The 14 frequently cited, but not as frequently cited, and the eight incentives less frequently incited, cited as, as used or needed. And that's not to say that these aren't important. We're not trying to identify the answer, the solution to effective and equitable MPA. But this nonetheless gives you an indication of how likely a given incentive is likely to be, um, uh, uh, how frequently it's used around the world, therefore, how, how likely it is to be relevant to any given case study MPA. So this is designed as much as a practitioner's tool so that they can look at different examples of incentives. They can drill down to the detail of how they've been applied in different case studies and also how they've been functionally integrated. But let's come back to the overall findings, drawing this all together now. We also found that there is a strong correlation between the effectiveness of marine protected areas and the number of governance incentives used through this correlation analysis. So the more diverse the incentives, the more effective the marine protected area. We also mapped out the case studies. These are the 50 case studies up the side here, and these are our 36 incentives. These are the least effective MPA case studies down here, two case studies with an effectiveness score of zero. This is Nha Trang Bay in Vietnam, incidentally. And these are the most effective MPAs. Only one case study got an effectiveness score of four. And that was the smallest case study in the sample, Chumba in Zanzibar. And we have a spread of effectiveness scores in between. And the key thing to take from this slide is that as we move into the more effective MPAs, more and more of these incentives are sufficiently strongly applied, indicated here by these dark rectangles. Whereas here, in these ineffective MPAs, it was found to be because the incentives were very few and they were only very weakly being applied. And again, this illustrates combinations of economic, legal, communication, knowledge and participatory incentives are shown to be employed in effective MPAs and mostly needed in less effective MPAs. 
We also carried out a genetic algorithm analysis, and I won't go into the details of this, but uh, it indicates if any particular incentives, combinations of incentives or contextual factors like human development in index, um, per capita GDP. We also looked at a variety of, of governance metrics, if you like, including state capacity, the, the strength of the state. If any of these incentives, combinations of incentives or contextual factors best predict effectiveness. And this found that while some incentives are frequently identified as helping to promote effectiveness, there are no particular magic wand incentives or good practice combinations of incentives that consistently guarantee this. Every case study is a unique social and ecological system, a complex, adaptive, social ecological system. So this research is trying to get away from the idea that we can identify which governance approach is best or right, or which incentive is the most important, and instead focus on how incentives are functionally integrated and governance approaches combined. So, so reaching some co-evolutionary conclusion, conclusions now. What key attribute confers stability in ecosystems? Ecologists argued about this for a couple of centuries. And then towards the end of the 1990s, the, 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 the settlement was up, the argument was settled. The attribute that confers stability in ecosystems is diversity. A diversity of species from different functional groups synergistically interacting to confer stability and resilience to the ecosystem. And this is why ecologists increasingly take a synecological focus on the wider functional integration of species. Remember this word, a synecological, looking at how species from different functional groups, functional groups interact with each other. What key attribute confers stability in governance systems? Guess what? It's diversity. But now it's a diversity of functionally integrated incentives. And we now adopt this synecological focus on the, the, the functional integration of incentives is very much the approach that this research takes. But in the same way as you must have the right species assemblages for a particular ecosystem, it is important to have the right incentives for a particular MPA governance context. This is not a numbers game. Yeah, that they must be the right incentives that have been appropriately developed and implemented and functionally integrated with the other incentives. It's not a numbers game. Now we can start to think about MPAs as co-evolutionary social and ecological systems with reciprocal feedback. Our research, like many researchers now, we adopt this social ecological systems and look at the feedback between the two systems. So here we have a, a re, an MPA represented as a social ecological system with a low diversity of weakly interacting incentives leading to high human impacts here and thereby a low diversity of weakly interacting species because of the impacts of these, we'll throw that away, because of the impacts of, of, of human activities. And the average effectiveness score of two indicates that many MPAs are in this depleted diversity state. This is actually a pretty good representation. So we have a uh, a, a quite low diversity social system, governance system, a low diversity ecosystem because of the impacts of human activities and any weak flows of ecosystem services being fed back from the ecosystem. More positively, though, if the NPA governance framework has improved through a diversity of functionally integrated incentives, this reduces human impacts. This in turn enables the ecosystem to start to recover to a more healthy, diverse system. And, and this should deliver an enhanced flow of ecosystem services and benefits, but there is a time lag. It takes three to five years until these impacts are reduced before the ecosystem starts to deliver an enhanced flow of ecosystem services. And it can take as long as 35 to 50 years to fully recover ecosystems. But eventually, 
the ecosystem will recover so long as the human impacts are, are, are continue to be reduced through our diverse governance social system. The, the, the different functional groups of species will recover and this ecosystem will start to deliver strong flows of ecosystem services in terms of coastal defence, food provision, tourism, etc. The key thing then perhaps, and again, there's a key role for the, for, the, for the incentives here, is how do we bridge the time gap between reducing the impacts uh, uh, and the enhanced flows of ecosystem services, providing the positive feedback from the ecosystem. And grounding this concept, we have some examples of how resilience can be built through more effective governance. So to mention a couple, Chumba Island Coral Park in Zanzibar, and Dila Natividad Marine Protected Area in Mexico, both evidencing resilience to ocean heat waves, the frequency and intensity of which is increasing due to climate change. But of course, there are import, there are limits to such resilience. Let's look at the Great Barrier Reef. Scale is a recurring theme in geography. I'm, a, I'm in a geography department at the UCL, and the Great Barrier Reef is very large. If it were in Europe, it would stretch from Aberdeen to, to, to Lisbon. But we also have to consider the scale of impacts. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park being inspiring in that it shows that how an increasing protection, level of protection from local impacts can build resilience. And in this case study, um, the no-take zones were increased in 2003 from 4.7% to 33.6% of the total Great Barrier Reef Marine Park area, which is itself fast, as I previously indicated. And then it was found that no-take zones within the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park were found to be more resilient to crown of thorn starfish outbreaks, and they recovered sooner, based on this excellent work by McCook in 2010. But more recently, we see that the Great Barrier Reef is, is also potentially quite depressing, as it's becoming increasingly evident that it is gravely threatened by coral bleaching due to the global scale impacts of climate change, from which no degree of local scale protection can confer resilience. MPAs do function as hope spots, uh, um, that, but there are limits to that hope, there are limits to that resilience. Uh, and, it's crucial that the Great Barrier Reef, like other marine and terrestrial ecosystems threatened by climate change, must become an international wake-up call and inspiration for the lifestyle changes and structural transformations needed to urgently address climate change. So one of the things that we do in this research is distinguish between proximal local impacts and wide-scale distal impacts so that we can look at the limits to resilience. But it isn't just about increasing the number and diversity of incentives, as I've already mentioned. It's also important to consider how incentives from the different categories interact with and support each other. Again, this is that approach that we, the parallel of is synecology and ecology. We very much take a, a synecology approach to analysing governance, focusing on how incentives co-evolve and are working in combination through their functional integration. And once you adopt this co-evolutionary governance approach, the distinction between top-down, bottom-up and market approaches becomes blurred, if not irrelevant, as you need to combine incentives based on all three approaches. So drawing it all together now in the final few minutes, in the face of strong driving forces, the combined use of a diversity of functionally integrated incentives makes MPA governance frameworks more resilient. This is the key findings of the study overall. Resilience in MPA governance frameworks is woven by complex webs, connecting incentives from all five categories, <coughs> i.e. a combination of those three governance approaches, along with communication and collective learning approaches. But without strong legal incentives to reinforce the MPA governance framework, it will not be resilient. So one of the key findings of this work is that participative approaches are important, market approaches are important, but so are legal regulations. 
We also see that the complexity of social and ecological systems can be considered to have the potential to co-evolve in an upward spiral of ecological recovery and increased cooperation to reduce impacts, leading to more resilient social ecological systems. And equally, we know that MPAs as social ecological systems can go on a downward spiral, a ratcheting downward spiral. So this research is to try to identify the pathway for this upward co-evolutionary um, development of social and ecological systems. So accepting that all functional groups of species are important, the question of which category of incentives is most important becomes irrelevant as they are all important in the same way as all functional groups of species are important. Ecologists don't argue about which functional group is more of species is more important because we need them all. But having said that, accepting that apex predators have particularly important regulatory roles in ecosystems. Legal incentives could be considered to be analogous to apex predators in that they also have particularly important regulatory roles, but they can only function with the diversity of incentives from the other categories. In the same way that you can't make an ecosystem out of apex predators, you can't make a governance framework out of legal incentives. So again, this is all pointing to the overall conclusion really. As I've mentioned, this is as much a practitioner's focused research as it is, it is, is, is academic and, 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 and theoretical focus. So we've developed this guidance with UNEP based on 34 of these case studies, which has been used by managers from around the world to look at MPAs as co-evolutionary social ecological systems, focusing on how these 36 incentives can be functionally integrated in different case studies. And this leads us all to the conclusion reached in the final sentence of the book and the UNEP guidance and this recent paper, diversity is the key to resilience, both of species in ecosystems and incentives in governance systems. And that's a conclusion of which I think Yoda would be proud. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, that was a great and very thorough overview. Um, and I've posted the links for you, uh, although one we'll talk about afterwards. So let's see, we have a number of questions already and time to do quite a few questions. Um, let's see, Peter, interestingly, you say that the smallest case study was one of the most effective MPAs. Does size and potential remoteness of MPAs have any bearing on how many interventions are needed to make the MPA more effective? I think in Zan, in the case of Chumba, it, it, it's not a particularly remote place. It's quite a, it's a heavily used place. There are high levels of poverty, uh, problems with corruption. Um, so no, we didn't find any particular correlation because uh, this kind of goes back to the, how mobile the users of marine ecosystems are, are and how wide scale um, ecosystems are, because we, we even remote MPAs will have people going in and trying to fish them. Tourism developers will eventually find them. So, no, we didn't find any particular pattern between remoteness uh, uh, and, uh, and effectiveness. But having said that, we did purposefully avoid what, what some term residual MPAs. MPAs that were designated in, in situations where we know there are no proximal human impacts. But no, that wasn't a particular finding. I think in the case of Chumba, it was, if anyone knows Chumba, it was the force of nature that is Sybil Reed Miller. That is really one of the main reasons why it was um, one of the more effective MPAs, perhaps also along with its size. But it is still being celebrated as one of the best examples of ecotourism in the world. So um, we stand by that finding. But no, I don't think it's necessarily related to its very small size. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, also, my internet is getting a little wobbly, so I'm going to make you co-host right now. So you might see a few changes in your inter user interface. But um, let's see. Uh, Sybil Reed -Mil Miller from uh, Chumbe uh, did established and managed MPA. Um, another question that came up, Peter, is um, 
question is related with choosing the right incentives. How do we know? Okay, you're cutting out a bit there, but I can see that question, Sarah. Um, go down and speak with the managers of that MPA. Go down and speak to the people that live in and use that MPA. This is fundamentally ethnographic research. So you go out and talk to people. You analyze the policy documents. Um, you observe. So really, that's it, it's a qualitative, descriptive way of discovering the strengths and weaknesses of the incentives and which ones need to be strengthened and which ones need to be introduced. Um, no, there's no, there's no magic wand which enables us to identify the incentives, but you might want to start with those 14 incentives that are more frequently cited as being used or needed and then move on to the 14 that are frequently but not as frequently cited. And then lastly, but certainly, don't rule them out, the eight that are sometimes only rarely needed, but in some MPAs, they're absolutely crucial. So the key thing is that we want to get away from templates or golden rules. The golden rule, if anything, is it's it's a function, it's a diversity of functionally integrated incentives. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm just going to say if I disappear, it's because there was a... You could select questions from the chat or the question and answer as best you're able and just answer them. But for right now, I think I'm here and that you can all hear me. Okay, so another question, um, it that was sort of two parts. Um, can you explain the criteria for selecting the 50 MPAs? Well, as I mentioned, uh, the sample size was mostly opportunistic. But when I started, when we started this research back in 2009, we launched it at Impact 3 with my friend who, um, Ola Vestergaard, who I can see is in the audience here. Hello, Ola, long time no see. Um, when we launched this case study, these case studies, <clears throat> I knew there were certain MPAs that had to be included. So the Great Barrier Reef, Galapagos Marine Reserve, being the two that spring to mind, but they probably weren't the only ones. But other MPAs were identified because an MSc student from UCL or another university, or a PhD student from UCL or another university would come to me saying, well, I want to focus on these MPAs. Might these be suitable for your, for your portfolio of case studies? So it was a combination of targeted to a degree, but mostly opportunistic. We didn't have any, any specific explicit criteria other than I think perhaps to avoid residual MPAs that were so remote um, but I, we never turned down a marine protected area case study. And I think there was one question which I just want to consider briefly, which I saw on the chat, which is how can these lessons be applied to high seas MPAs? And working with an MSc student, uh, we actually analysed this concept of co-evolutionary governance. We looked at this, the rationale, if you like, behind it. And one of the case studies... <clears throat> that cited in, in, in Jones et al. 2024 um, goes, discusses how this rationale and framework could be applied to better understand how high, high seas MPAs could work. Wonderful, Peter. Um, another question that came in, does, does this re research differentiate between the incentives needed for setting up MPAs versus governing existing MPAs? Um, it distinguishes between the incentives that are currently used in a given marine protected area and which incentives are considered to be priorities, particularly important priorities for strengthening amongst those need used MPAs and which incentives are particularly important priorities for introducing. So it doesn't focus on which ones are needed in general, but there are learnings from the frequency with which incentives are considered to be needed across the 50 case studies. Um, so all, it's, it's an empirical case study driven research approach. So it's all down to case study MPAs, but that's how we distinguished between incentives that are used used but need strengthening, 
or not used, but are particularly important priorities for introducing. Uh, that was the approach that evolved. I see evolution and co-evolution everywhere. Uh, that's the approach that very much evolved through these 50 case studies over the last 15 years. Okay, thank you, Peter. Another question. Um, hi, Peter, excellent work. Do you think this model could be used to analyze marine spatial plans? It's a very good question. Um, we did actually, I was, I led the governance stream of an EC funded project, uh, MESMA, and we tried to use the framework for marine spatial planning, but we couldn't get the marine spatial planners to agree on what I call the directionality of marine spatial planning. To me, marine spatial planning is all about achieving good ecological status, to use an EC policy speak term, restoring marine ecosystems. But other MSP practitioners and researchers would say, no, actually, our MSP framework strategically is focused on delivering blue growth targets or marine renewable targets. And without that directionality to consistently analyze effectiveness, um, it became problematic. Um, and it soon became evident that the practitioners and the researchers just would not agree on saying, well, okay, an effective marine spatial plan is one that achieves good ecological status. So we kind of developed a, a nonetheless systematic diff, but different approach. But having said that, marine protected areas ultimately are all about marine spatial planning. So I very much see marine protected areas as a subset of, of marine spatial planning um, to which this analysis framework can be applied. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm gonna group two questions and this may be the last question we have time for, uh, unfortunately, because there's a number of really great questions, uh, but I'll be passing them all on to Peter um, at the end of the webinar. So uh, the first one is, um, it would be interesting to hear more about the indicators of effectiveness that you used to develop the scores out of five. Were they a balance of social and ecological indicators? How did you measure equity and governance? Thank you. Um, and um, then the other, well, and I'll, there was another, yeah, just to answer that, yeah, and then I'll get the other question too. Um, it's very difficult to put, I mean, we didn't develop a metric for, 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 assessing effectiveness. Again, this is a qualitative judgment that we roughly assigned to a scoring system just to make it more apparent. But at the end of the day, this is a qualitative judgment. But again, it was about going out and talking to people. It was saying, have the impacts of this activity been reduced? Have the impacts of this activity been reduced? So effectiveness is very much framed in terms of have the impacts of proximal human activities, local impacts, have they been reduced in order to promote resilience to the distal wide scale impacts? Equity similarly was <clears throat> discussed on a qualitative basis. Do people think the MPA is fair? Do they think that the decisions taken are just? Do they think that the enforcement of the MPAs is just and fair? So, um, that's why we shied away from developing, we, we did have a go at developing a rough scoring system for effectiveness based on those impacts, but um, I would be very wary of coming up with a metric to describe equity. But having said that, we can look at certain things like the Gini index for, for countries will we'll give you a statistical representation of, of economic equality or inequality in an area. So there are metrics that you can draw on. Um, but um, no, our effectiveness was very much focused on have the impacts, the degree to which the impacts of human activities have been reduced. And then alongside that, we consider equity in terms of justice and fairness. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, perhaps if I could just take that one question from Marion Glazer very quickly, Sarah, <laughs> if I may. Sure, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, wait, but in case, for all those people who are going to need to hop off the call, let me just um, 
say a couple of things. Um, there was a link Peter gave to the slides. We'll, but the, that's not working. We'll work on getting that fixed, but keep that link um, if you want to get to the slides. And also, I was just going to add, Peter is willing to do this talk again for other audiences. So if you want, you can get Yes, um, I'll this. fix that link so that you can get all the slides. Thank you very much for reminding me of that, Sarah. And thank you again for the opportunity. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and do the, the question from Marion Glazer now. Are you there, Marion? Um, I'll go ahead and, and read it. Um, it said, you started off by saying that SES as a concept does not fly because of clear boundaries, but then you employed SES concept in your talk. What is the rationale here? Um, which SE? There are obviously parallels between co-evolutionary governance and the social ecological systems framework, but we don't use the same critical enabling conditions mainly because one of those critical enabling conditions is 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 fairly impermeable well-defined boundaries um, a lack of boundaries being discussed in terms of scale challenges so whilst there are some parallels between co-evolutionary governance and social ecological systems i think that's the that if you like is the, is the defining difference between the two approaches but i hasten to add that this is in no way uh, a a criticism uh, of the social ecological systems framework. I mean, my research was inspired by Eleanor Ostrom's research. Um, I think it's just, we prefer to think of it in terms of like an evolutionary testing of how, how the concept can be further developed. So inevitably there are some commonalities between the two frameworks, but also I think some very important differences. Right. And I think Thank probably you. the most, it's a good point to draw a line under it, it's, a, it's constructively embracing the role of the state in order to address the biodiversity loss crisis and climate change. Um, it's saying that, of course, bottom-up approaches are important, market approaches are important, but so is a, a varying degrees of, 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 of state coordination. Um, not going back to command and control fortress conservation, but nonetheless, the, the role of the state is being reconfigured it's evolving as the challenges facing society evolve. So rather than saying the state shouldn't interfere or have a, any regulatory role, we simply step back and say, let's consider a reconfigured role of the state. And um, I hope that clarifies that a little, Marin. Yes, thank you. Great, okay. Sorry, okay, Mary, thank you very I, much. I, I know too people earlier. are going now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Peter. And thank you to everyone for, for attending and participating. And we hope to catch you on a future webinar. And thank you again, Peter. Thank you. Bye-bye.